Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Ah, yes. The first Thanksgiving. I was a kid in elementary school, and I remember being taught the story of the first Thanksgiving. I was in this tiny little Christian school cocoon, and that occasion was probably best represented by these popular illustrations. They're all over the place. They show this long table. And I mean, in almost every depiction of the first Thanksgiving, there's this long table, and it's drawn like this huge picnic table. And there are participants all around, mostly white pilgrims, and they are surrounded by the lovely red and yellow and purple and brown colors of autumn, such a warm and happy scene. And I am reminded of that famous painting by Jenny Augusta Brownscombe from 1914. Have you seen it? The big oil painting called The First Thanksgiving at Plymouth. It's a lovely oil painting. And as we've seen in various Thanksgiving depictions, there is that long table, and it's loaded with food, and all around the table we see the bowed heads of the pilgrims, and they are saying the blessing, you know, the thank you prayer to their God for his great goodness. And then if you look beyond the table, you see a mother, oh, she's so sweet and pure and happy, and She's got a four-year-old daughter that's standing at her knee, and look, there's a baby. There's a little baby in a tiny wooden rocker, and it's all so peaceful in that moment. This is a moment for families. And sitting off in the distance, about 50 feet from that table, there's this cluster of Native Americans, and they're cross-legged, sitting on the ground. They're watching everything play out. And then at the head of this long table, Standing next to 15 white pilgrims, we see what appears to be Native American chiefs. There are three of them. So the narrative goes, and this is how children are taught the story. In fact, children and their parents are taught the story. The couth and civilized Europeans arrive on the shore. Oh, look, they have encountered the uncivilized and even savage Indians or Native Americans, and they were kind enough to open up their table And they all said the Christian prayer, and they ate turkey together, and they incorporated their lives and lived happily ever after. Okay, this cartoon has become the American Thanksgiving story. Well, you're already way ahead of me here, because unlike many people, you have studied your history. The Thanksgiving story, it's yet another example of how we painted these sort of happy watercolors over the crime scenes of our past. Time Magazine did a profile of Thanksgiving, and they called the whole Thanksgiving story a harmful lie. There was an article in 2018 by Robert Jensen at Alternet. He just called it genocide. There's an organization called Native Americans of New England. They designated the fourth Thursday of November, not Thanksgiving. They call it the National Day of of mourning, and Native American tribes across the country actually commemorate that day for that reason. For what reasons? Well, we're going to talk about it on this broadcast. We're going to have an honest conversation about the holiday. Now, I'm not saying we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. I'm not saying we don't take an opportunity to give thanks. I'm not saying that the holiday can't mean something different, okay? But I am saying that we have to understand how the writers of history have cheated us of the facts. Facts including the reality of racism, oppression, conquest, and yes, genocide. The history can be complicated. There's no way I'm going to be able to hit everything here. But the basics go something like this. I'm going to jump back a couple hundred years before Plymouth Rock and the Mayflower, that story, to talk about Christopher Columbus. 
This marks another great example of the whitewashed history that is so prevalent here in my country. There was a speech on Independence Day, July the 4th. President Donald Trump suggested the American way of life began in 1492 when Columbus discovered America. Now, the story is that Columbus discovered America on his famous trip across the Atlantic in 1492, his ships being the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And of course, America was here just waiting for Columbus to discover it. In fact, the story was told to children, taught to us in this poem. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He had three ships and left from Spain. He sailed through sunshine, wind, and rain. He sailed by night, he sailed by day, he used the stars to find his way. A compass also helped him know how to find the way to go. Ninety sailors were on board, some men worked while others snored. Then the workers went to sleep, and others watched the ocean deep. Day after day they looked for land, they dreamed of trees and rocks and sand. October 12th, their dream came true. You never saw a happier crew. Indians, Indians, Columbus cried. His heart was filled with joyful pride. But India, the land was not. It was the Bahamas, and it was hot. The Arawak neighbors were very nice. They gave the sailors food and spice. Columbus sailed on to find some gold, to bring back home as he'd been told. He made the trip again and again, trading gold to bring to Spain. The first American? No, not quite. But Columbus was brave, and he was bright. Oh, what a happy, beautiful little poem. What a wonderful story about Columbus who sailed the ocean blue. And of course, the bullshit is strong with this little ditty. First of all, the three ships probably weren't even named. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. The Santa Maria was known at the time as La Gallega, meaning the Galatian. The Nina was probably a nickname for a ship originally called the Santa Clara, and it's likely that Pinta was a nickname as well, not the name of the actual ship. And Christopher Columbus took four separate trips. He started with the famous one in 1492. He landed on various Caribbean islands. He explored the Central and South American coasts. But hey, my fellow citizens, Columbus never set foot in North America ever. Christopher Columbus was never here. He never declared that he had discovered a new continent or the new world. In fact, it's believed that the Norse explorer Leif Erikson actually reached upward into Canada. That was about 500 years before Columbus was even born. So, yeah, Christopher Columbus discovered some stuff, but he did not discover America. Now, Columbus's trips were actually financed by the king and queen of Spain, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And many of the trips were actually sponsored on false pretenses. So Columbus goes out on his first voyage, and he goes back to the king and queen, and he gives them a false report. He says, hey, my first trip has revealed a faster route to East Asia. And so the king and queen say, well, that's fantastic. We've got a quicker route to conduct trade. Let's finance Christopher Columbus for three more journeys across the ocean to the so-called Americas. And those next three journeys happened in 1493, 1498, and 1502. So Columbus was then well-provisioned and well-funded, and he was given this edict by the king and queen. They commanded him to, quote, Endeavor to win over the inhabitants and to treat them very well and lovingly and abstain from doing them any injury. That's what the king and queen of Spain told Columbus. And he promptly took that instruction and he tossed it in the garbage can. And he replaced it with instance after instance of brutality, cruelty, racism, and oppression. Yes, my fellow Americans... Christopher Columbus was a tyrannical racist. Now, I can imagine the recoil 
among my sort of red state, God and country, flag waving Americans, especially the Christian nationalist. You call Columbus a terrorist, <laughs> right? Which is what he was. I mean, he inflicted terror on people. You mention this fact to the flag wavers in my country, and this sounds like heresy. Will they go deeper? Will they take the journey? Will they actually look up the data to learn the true story of Columbus? Of course not, because they've already got an emotional connection to the happy, clappy poem, the story about Columbus who sailed the ocean blue, that Columbus who was brave and he was bright. What a noble man, Christopher Columbus. I doubt they have heard the story from the 12th of October, 1492. It was the Lucayan people. They were the first indigenous people that Christopher Columbus stumbled upon. He'd sailed his three ships looking for a direct route to India, and then he veers thousands of miles off course. Christopher Columbus landed in this quote-unquote new world mostly because he got lost. He couldn't steer the ships, okay? And I'm sure the Lucayan people were so grateful that he accidentally stumbled upon them. At the spot where he did land, the Lucayan people did treat him warmly, right? These are newcomers. And so the Lucayan people came out and offered Columbus and his crew food and water. Columbus then went and wrote in his journal, and this is a quote, With 50 men, they can all be subjugated and made to do what is required of them. He's talking about the indigenous people. All it takes is 50 of my guys, and we can subjugate them and make them do what we want. Columbus then kidnapped some of the Lucayan people, and he transported them back to Spain. Then, and here's the guy that America was actually named for, a merchant explorer. His name is Amerigo Vespucci, right? Amerigo, and that's where we get America. This guy would soon enter the same lands that Columbus did, and he kidnapped the Lucayans by the hundreds, and he enslaved them by the thousands. Thank you, newcomers, for coming to kidnap, enslave, and oppress us. It is estimated the Spanish might have carried away as many as 40,000 Lucayans by 1513. That's less than 20 years after Columbus made his entrance. My friends, it was Christopher Columbus who initiated the transatlantic slave trade. He enslaved and used other people for sex trafficking, including the sex slavery of children as young as nine years old. Old In regard to the Taino people, indigenous to the Caribbean islands and Florida, Columbus required an offering of gold every three months. He made the Taino people bring him gold, and if they did not present him with the gold, he would chop off their arms and leave them to bleed to death. Columbus was a brutal governor over those islands. He oppressed and terrorized not only the native people, but also the Spanish colonists who were under his rule. There was a Spanish historian and a Catholic priest named Bartolome de las Casas, and he was a good and noble man, and he was documenting these atrocities because he wanted the world to know about them. He had witnessed and chronicled the chamber of horrors under Columbus, swords ripping open the bellies of the Taino people chosen for execution. He saw dismemberment, beheadings. They would turn dogs loose on living victims to eat them alive, rape, and further horrors. There's a professor at the University of Vermont. His name is James Lowen. And he's on record revealing that Columbus's loyal lieutenants had been rewarded with native women, which they could rape. And many of those women were not actually women. They were children under 10 because those children were, quote, in demand. This is the celebrated discoverer of America. And he's honored with statues and songs and poems and children's stories, torturer, mutilator, murderer. It is bizarre how American history books and many American history teachers have neglected to actually round out the Columbus story with these atrocities. How about the account of Columbus's arrest? Because news of his horrible deeds and those of his wicked brothers, he had three brothers and they were all just terrible people. The news of all this craziness finally went back to the court of Spain. 
and they took action. Columbus was removed as governor, and he was returned back to Spain in chains on one of Columbus's own ships. So he stands before the court of Spain, and he's pleading his case before the royals. And go figure, he was ultimately given a pardon. Yeah, he'd been cruel and hideous and terrorizing and monstrous, but you know, he also brought in a lot of money. He brought great wealth to the nation of Spain. And so, as history has so often shown us, money covers a whole lot of blood very conveniently. Now, again, I've diverged from the Thanksgiving story back to Columbus because one legend informs the other, one story informs the other. I think it also, again, provides a great example of how the history books have been totally sanitized to validate the oppressors and marginalize those who have been oppressed. Yes, the poem says, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and on the tortured victims bled another ocean bloodied red. I should also note that on the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Columbus, or on Columbus Day, back in 1992, Berkeley, California, began observing Indigenous Peoples Day. And this started to catch on around the United States, and many people on Columbus Day actually don't celebrate Columbus, but they mark the occasion of Indigenous Peoples Day to remember the past and commemorate Native American history and culture. So that's the first chapter of our little history lesson today. We're going to talk about the first Thanksgiving. Such a beautiful story, but is it really? Our history lesson about the origins of Thanksgiving continues next. Finding time. Making time. This is the struggle, isn't it? Time to learn stuff and work on ourselves. My friends, you need an app. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist takes the key ideas and insights from over 4,000 nonfiction bestsellers in more than 27 categories and distills them down to about 15-minute text or audio blinks, the core ideas of a book which you can digest in a single sitting. Easily searchable based on what you're interested in, Blinkist has also teamed up with popular podcast creators to blink those down for you as well, so you can get to the heart of the topics being discussed. On a walk, on a workout, on a single commute, 15 million people have discovered Blinkist, and I'm one of them, usually out listening when I'm walking Linus or driving out in the car somewhere. I really enjoyed Olga Kazan's book called Weird. The book is so freaking good, you know, it looks at labels like different against the reality that our weirdness can be a wonderful thing. Took me 12 minutes to listen to it on Blinkist, by the way. Richard Dawkins' Outgrowing God remains a hugely compelling guide on why and how science will beat superstition every time. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Seth to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Seth to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Seth. We started the broadcast talking a little bit about Columbus and his quote-unquote discovery of America. Now we jump forward to the early 1600s for the next chapter of our story. There's the popular story that Americans like to draw in crayon. It begins with the declaration that the pilgrims left England to find religious freedom. And they sailed on the Mayflower and they landed at Plymouth Rock to start their new lives peacefully among the natives. There were 102 passengers on the Mayflower. Just 41 of them were true pilgrims looking for freedom from the Church of England. For the rest of them, they were known as the Strangers. The pilgrims actually sort of divided into two camps. There were the pilgrims, and then the others not looking for religious liberty or freedom. They were known as the Strangers. They were there to sort of create commerce and financial opportunity. Okay, And these people had already been to Holland. They settled in the city of Leiden. 
And so they were already there, enjoying tolerance and religious freedom that was far above much of the rest of the world, right? I mean, they were in a pretty good place in Holland. So if it was all about sort of moving to escape religious oppression, that doesn't make much sense. Doesn't make any sense. They'd pack everything up for a journey here just for that. More likely, they were looking for a better place to express their English identity and make a living. Because earning money and making a living and finding work had proven for them more difficult in Holland. If you travel to Plymouth today, you will find Plymouth Rock. This is the designated site where Governor William Bradford and the Mayflower Pilgrims established the first colony. It was December of 1620. In fact, the year 1620 is actually embossed. It's inscribed on Plymouth Rock. The rock is about the size of a sofa, and it weighs about 10 tons. The rock actually split. They tried to move it back in the 1700s. They tied 20 oxen to it. And they were going to move it to another location. And they broke the rock in half. Plymouth Rock is on display right now at Pilgrim Memorial State Park. And they built this big elevated platform all around it. So you can walk up and then look down and see Plymouth Rock. By the way, visitors to Plymouth Rock describe it as the most boring and unimpressive tourist attraction <laughs> they have ever seen. I mean, it's a rock. It's a rock. The size of a couch. But is it the rock marking the landing site of William Bradford and his pilgrims? Well, there's no historical evidence to confirm that Plymouth Rock was actually the literal stepping stone into the New World. In fact, the pilgrims didn't actually land at Plymouth first. It was a month before Plymouth that they first made landfall. They were on the tip of Cape Cod. But those were dangerous waters, and so they relocated. They moved to safer harbors the next month, the month of December, and they landed at Plymouth. And William Bradford never once mentioned Plymouth Rock or any rock. By the way, neither did any of the people who took the journey with him. Okay, so none of the pilgrims ever said a word about Plymouth Rock. Where did it come from? Well, that didn't happen until 1741. This is 121 years after the landing, okay? And there was this church elder, he's a 94-year-old guy named Thomas Founce. And he claimed that his dad had been among the original pilgrims on the Mayflower. And so he said, hey, my father told me that they landed at Plymouth Rock. And that's it. That's where the story came from. The entire account is based on this sort of unverified verbal claim of a very old man who said, you know what? My dad told me that is how a chunk of granite became the supposed cornerstone of the entire country. And already the magic of Thanksgiving is starting to wane. But let us proceed as modern day pilgrims into this strange new world. By the way, if you think the pilgrims were the first people to hold a feast of Thanksgiving for the bountiful harvest, you've got to be kidding. The indigenous Native American people had already had long traditions involving giving thanks and Thanksgiving celebrations. The Algonquin people had specific celebrations related to the harvests, right? The harvesting of crops. The nearby Wampanoag people held a strawberry Thanksgiving that was to celebrate the first harvest of the new season. Europeans who came to North America long before the pilgrims also had observations of the harvest and they gave thanks. History talks about the observance by the French Huguenots near present-day Jacksonville, Florida, an observance of a Thanksgiving. That was as far back as 1564. That's about 60 years before the Mayflower. Also in the mid-1500s, Spanish documents talk about a Thanksgiving Mass that celebrated St. Augustine by conquistadors. And Texas historians say that Spanish colonists held Thanksgiving celebrations with the Manso Indians in 1598. That happened near the spot that is today El Paso, Texas. And this would be a full generation before any Thanksgiving feast at Plymouth, Massachusetts. 
Beyond that, the occasion at Plymouth wasn't even really a Thanksgiving feast. It was part of a religious exercise. Think of a church service designed to worship a specific god, a god that was most certainly not the god of the indigenous people. Now, here's another busted myth about the pilgrims. You think about those old elementary school Thanksgiving plays? How do they dress the child actors, the ones who are playing the pilgrims? They put them in these Puritan black costumes, right? The black and the white, modest and solemn. They look like Amish people with belt buckles and big hats, okay? This is total crap. (laughs) The truth is the pilgrims actually enjoyed bright colors. Early inventories from Plymouth Colony reveal an abundance of fabrics that were red and blue and green and orange and yellow. Governor Bradford himself liked to sport this big colorful hat and he even wore a red suit with a purple cloak. The pilgrims could in fact be pretty gaudy people. Now, I want to talk just a second about the Mayflower Compact. And they talk about this in American history classes. It's kind of a precursor to our Constitution, or at least the Declaration of Independence. You know, this was this noble set of rules that we put in place when we got to the colonies or established the colonies because we are civilized. Well, that's not exactly the whole story. The true story is, is that before the Mayflower even landed on any shore, there was dissent among the people. You had the pilgrims who were looking for some kind of independent religious expression. Then you had the strangers. These were the others who were on the boat, about half or even more than half of the occupants. Well, because of really bad storms, the Mayflower didn't land at first at its original destination. Right, ended up on the tip of Cape Cod. So a bunch of people on the boat said, hey, wait a minute, this isn't the original plan, so maybe we're exempt from the entire contract with England and the Virginia Company, right? Oh, you change the rules. We don't have to play by your rules. We don't have to do what you say. So there's this dissent on the Mayflower. And the pilgrims decided they needed to do something about it. And they drafted the Mayflower Compact. It's about a 200-word document. And they signed it to establish laws or rules by which everybody had to abide. And nearly all of the adult male passengers of the Mayflower signed this thing. They actually signed the Mayflower Compact on the boat, right? They're quelling dissent. And what's interesting is that it's not a constitution. It's really a church covenant. If you look at the Mayflower Compact, mostly it's saying that they have to abide by a specific set of rules under a divine right of kings, and they have to promote the Christian religion. So this was a religious document. It wasn't an early version of the United States Constitution. Okay, so the Puritans hit Cape Cod in November, and then they relocate to Plymouth in December. And they disembark and start to establish their colony. It was the indigenous Wampanoag people. They helped the first wave of Puritans who got here. This was in 1621. And they taught them to plant crops and how to hunt wild game and survive. The first official mention of a Thanksgiving, that occurred 16 years later. Later, and check this out, this was not a feast giving thanks for the harvest or good weather or for peace among men and women. At that point, they were giving thanks for conquest. Now, allow me to explain. The Pequots, they were the dominant Native American tribe in the southeastern portion of the Connecticut colony. So English and Dutch colonists were there and they were trading with the Pequot tribe. They traded furs and things like that. But there was conflict among the Pequot people and two other tribes, sort of this fighting among the natives. And colonists started to choose sides. Well, which tribe are you with? Well, I'm with this tribe. Which tribe are you with? Well, I'm on the tribe of the other side. You know, everybody was choosing sides. So on the 26th of May, 1637, with tensions on the rise, Connecticut colonists under Captain John Mason allied with the enemies of the Pequot tribe to attack them. There was a militia, 90 colonists. They joined 200 Native American warriors. 
and they surrounded this Pequot village for a surprise attack. They met fierce resistance, and Captain Mason ultimately ordered the entire village to be set on fire, and then they shot anybody who tried to climb over the wooden fences to escape. I mean, it was a freaking massacre. The Pequot people were burned alive and shot. Men, women, the elderly, the infirmed, young children, estimates of the dead ranging from 400 to 700 people. In fact, the Pequot numbers were so diminished that they essentially ceased to be a tribe. I mean, they wiped out the tribe. Many remaining in the few of the survivors, they were sold into slavery. You should look up the story and read the details. It's horrifying. The slaughter took place near the Mystic River, so it has become known as the Mystic Massacre. There's a historian, Alden Vaughn. He wrote a book called The New England Frontier, Puritans and Indians, 1620 to 1675. And he called this particular event, this massacre, he called it a game changer that had a profound effect on the relationship between the English and the Native Americans. He said, quote, overnight, the balance of power had shifted from the populous but unorganized natives to the English colonies. The destruction of the Pequots cleared away the only major obstacle to Puritan expansion, and the thoroughness of that destruction made a deep impression on the other tribes. And for this massacre, for decades after it took place, colonists would mark the occasion and they would give thanks for their victory, and they would give thanks with parties and feasts, a big celebration of a bloody and barbaric conquest. Their fellow humans burned alive and shot down a bloody stain on the history of this nation, a history that is almost never discussed by those who are teaching our history. Now, it can't certainly be said that the Mystic Massacre is the main root of our modern-day Thanksgiving feast, but it's certainly part of the history, a part that should not be ignored. Since 1970, Native Americans have gathered on every Thanksgiving around Coles Hill at Plymouth Rock for their National Day of Mourning, and they remember Pequot and the Mystic Massacre. They remember what happened to their tribe back in 1637, and they honor the dead and they stand against the cruelty that slaughtered them. Okay, let's talk about Squanto. Squanto is a popular character in the American Thanksgiving story, Squanto, best known as a member of the Patuxet tribe. This is a subset of the Wampanoag tribe. And he was one of the first liaisons between the natives and the Mayflower pilgrims. The story that's taught to American students is pretty, you know, noble and dignified and good and happy clappy. The story of unity, this Native American, Squanto, and he kindly reached out to assist the newbie pilgrims, to help them survive. Squanto was a helper. He was a kindred spirit. He was a friend to the pilgrims. He translated. He taught them how to plant crops and fish and generally helped them live good lives. He was Squanto. Well, actually, Squanto wasn't his name. His name is Tisquantum. But he was nicknamed Squanto by Governor William Bradford at the time, and that's how he's known today. And that's how I'll refer to him here, Squanto. Guess what? He hadn't simply donated his time and his knowledge to the pilgrims out of the goodness of his heart. Squanto was actually a kidnap victim. He'd been captured by Captain George Weymouth of the Plymouth Company back in 1605, and they shipped him back to Britain because the captain thought his financial backers might like to see an actual Indian. Oh, look, they'd like to see a native. Let's grab this guy. Let's kidnap him. Let's put him on a boat, ship him back to Britain to show him off. Squanto eventually escaped, and he came back to his homeland in 1614. That's nine years later, probably as a guide on another English ship. So Squanto ends up back here, but then he's kidnapped a second time, and he's sold into slavery, this time in Spain. So he's in Spain. He escapes again with the help of some Spanish monks who decided to intervene on his behalf. And he actually lived among the monks for a few years at their monastery until finally he came back to North America in 1619. 
And when he gets home, after being kidnapped the second time he gets home, he discovers that his entire Patoxit tribe, his whole tribe, was dead from smallpox. The Europeans had come, and they brought with them a bunch of old-world diseases, diseases that the natives were not remotely prepared to deal with, the death of his entire tribe. Well, this ensures that the Europeans had fresh new lands to settle on. In fact, some of the colonists, they thought that God had sent the disease. God sent us the smallpox so that he could sort of clear out these lands and get rid of the people infesting them so that we could then occupy and live on them. Patoxit was not the only native village that was hit by disease. As much as 75% of the Wampanoag population was wiped out by disease. 75%. Now here we got some chess moves going on. And this is complicated, so stick with me, and I'll do my best to try to be clear, okay? The Wampanoag tribe, three-quarters of them wiped out by disease. Now, you're a rival tribe. You're the Narragansett tribe. You're over here, and you and the Wampanoags have been enemies for a long, long time. And you look over across the fence, and you think, holy shit, the Wampanoags have been decimated. There's hardly any of them left. This would be a great time to go in for the coup de grace. You know, we can just wipe them off the map entirely now that they are a tiny fraction of their former size. And you're a Wampanoag member, and you think, how in the world are we going to protect ourselves against this invasion, right? The enemy's coming, and we are way diminished because of disease. Well, they developed a strategy, and the leader of the local Wampanoag tribe, a guy named Massasoit, he thought, well, you know what? I can protect my group by making an alliance with the English, Right. Let's go in, let's control the supply of the colonists' goods, and let's make things friendly, and let's develop bonds so that they take us personally. This is a strategic relationship with the pilgrims to ensure that the Narragansetts can't come and wipe us out. All right, am I making sense so far? The Wampanoag tribe wants to be important trading partners with the colonists, so they've got an ally against their Native American enemy tribes. Massasoit took Squanto because they needed a translator to try to seal the deal, and Squanto was essentially in servitude to Massasoit. Right? He's thinking, oh shit, I'm still sort of beholden to this guy. I'm acting the servant, perhaps even the slave, to this man and his tribe. Man, I sure would like to bust out of that deal. So he goes and he translates between Massasoit and the pilgrims. That deal did not really pan out. But Squanto saw an opportunity. He said, hey, you know what? If I can come over here and liaise with the pilgrims myself, and I can donate my services to help them prepare for the winter and translate and teach them language, etc., This could be my escape hatch, man. I could get out of this Wampanoag deal. I could get out from under Massasoit, and I could do my own thing. And that's exactly what he did. Instead of going back to a life of tribal servitude, he became a partner with Governor William Bradford and the Pilgrims. And he was probably hugely relieved. I mean, you think about Squanto and his fellow tribesmen. I mean, they had lived the trauma of kidnapping, human trafficking, disease, slaughter, death. His assistance to the pilgrims had been preceded by not one, but two instances of his own capture, torture, slavery, and escape. Three, if you count his escape from Massasoit, right? And then there's the eradication of his entire tribe by disease. So we can see that Squanto's motivations were layered and complex and were informed by a really complicated backstory. Now, does that complex story fit into the description box that's under those illustrated pictures of Squanto? Of course it doesn't. On top of all that, you've got example after example of the attitude by the colonists in regard to Native Americans. Now, I want you to Google and read this. Don't take my word for it. I want you to Google and pull up the American Declaration of of independence, this celebrated document in our country. It was adopted by the Second Continental Congress on the 4th of July, 1776, in Philadelphia, and it explained why the 13 colonies would be independent of the Kingdom of Great Britain. 
We no longer abide by your law. We no longer exist by your domain. We are now 13 independent and sovereign states. And we say it clearly and formally in our Declaration of Independence. Pull it up right now. Take a look at it and scroll down through the document. The signers are there, and they call out the tyranny of the British king and their reasons for their independence. He's not allowing representation. He requires constant compliance. He doesn't care at all about the will of the people. He's divisive. He calls resources just for himself. He controls the courts. He controls the judges. He uses public office to harass his people. He's used his armies to oppress his people. He's isolated his country from the rest of the world. He's crushing the citizens with obscene taxes. He's stripped away basic rights. He's plundered and burned and destroyed. There's so much to digest here. Okay, but there is a line in the Declaration of Independence. Let me read it directly. He, the king... He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers and merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Now, did you catch that? The reference to the Native Americans is merciless Indian savages. Savages. That's how the founders of our country viewed the indigenous people. There's no allowance or admission or even mention of the countless tragedies that were endured by those people who were here before we got here, right? Before the Europeans got here, who lost so much after the colonists arrived on these shores. Now, there's no doubt that the Founding Fathers did do some genuinely amazing and groundbreaking and positively historic things in the establishment of this nation. But there's a tendency in this country to deify the Founding Fathers. They're saints in the eyes of a lot of people, and we have to look at them honestly, don't we? And see complex and often flawed people. I mean, many of our founding fathers were slave owners. And yes, many of them were also white supremacists. Don't tell me they took an accommodating and inclusive view of the indigenous people. Those who were here before the colonists, because that is certainly not always the case. In just a second, we're going to talk about how Thanksgiving became an actual, official national holiday, even as the United States went to literal war against Native American people so it could grab their land and resources. And I will give you specific examples. Our conversation about Thanksgiving continues after this. Talking here about Thanksgiving, we've covered the Mayflower and the Pilgrims and much of the early bloodshed. Let's talk now about the establishment of the first actual Thanksgiving, as far as a declaration by the government of a Thanksgiving, okay? It was founding father George Washington who proclaimed a national day of Thanksgiving in 1789. He asked Americans to gather on the last Thursday of November of that year to give thanks for an establishment of, quote, a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, this was just like a one-off. Let's get together on this Thursday to give thanks. And even then, there was controversy. You had members of Congress saying, you know what? This shouldn't be a federal thing or a national thing. It ought to be the state governors who decide on any holiday of this kind. Other people said Thanksgiving is a religious celebration because it had been a celebration of the Christian God. So a government-sponsored Thanksgiving would actually be inappropriate in a state church-separated republic. And even then, this was not an annual holiday. It wasn't declared an annual event until 1863. It was President Abraham Lincoln. He established Thanksgiving as a regular tradition. He was trying to find a symbol of unity after the tumult of the Civil War. Now, it was shortly after that civil war that white Protestant Americans were starting to get nervous and even angry because they saw this rising tide of immigrants into the United States. 
these European Catholics were coming in and the Jews were coming in and people from other nations and cultures and faith traditions, they're coming in by the boatload. How are we going to assert our cultural authority over all these immigrants? Well, we're going to rally around this mythical story that the pilgrims had come in much earlier and they'd stake their claims and the Native Americans had gladly welcomed them in to inhabit their lands. It's all laughable now that we look at it in retrospect. But if you look at it in the context of people trying to retain power, it was extremely useful politically and culturally. Remember, our government had been at war against American Indian and First Nation tribes all over. The settlers and the colonizers, they were just spreading across the continent. In the late 1700s, they saw almost constant resistance, constant conflicts against the natives that they were displacing, really. Native Americans, they lost whole states worth of fur trapping grounds for commerce after the War of 1812. There was the Indian Removal Act of 1830. It authorized this government the American government, to go in and just remove indigenous people from east of the Mississippi to the western frontier. And American settlers just kept pushing out. They're pushing west. They're pushing west. They're going. They're going. They're expanding. Indian tribes displaced out of their homelands, relocated to specially designated reservations. There were so many bloody battles, so many wars, so much resistance, so much conflict and conquest. It was time after time the Native Americans would resist. Time after time, they lost the battles. Many of the defeated tribes actually crossed the northern border up into Canada. Other people went down to Spanish-owned property in a place that is now Florida. And it's interesting to look at the Revolutionary War. This was not just a war by the American colonists against the British. It was also a war against Native Americans in the West, because many of those Native Americans, pissed off about the colonists who were coming into their lands and taking over and killing them, they sided with the British. What happens when the British lose the Revolutionary War? Those tribes lost as well, declared enemies of this new country. How many tribal chiefs had been forced, I mean forced, to sign contracts that gave away their lands and their birthright? How many families were split up or relocated? How many families were killed as the U.S. government had mobilized its war department to snuff out resistance? The battles between the natives and the government, they are historic. They are a matter of record from the Seminole Wars to the fierce battles in Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, Utah, Oregon, California, Washington State, the Sioux of the Northern Plains and the Apaches of the Southwest who declared war on the encroachers, the Comanches who pitted themselves against American settlers in Texas and Mexico, the battles with the gold rushers. Right, These prospectors, they wanted to come into native lands to find gold, so they just decided to go in and conquer and take it. The Dakota War, the Sand Creek Massacre, the Sioux War of 1865. In that same year, 1865, there was instituted a national policy, a national policy for all Native Americans to either assimilate into the rest of America's population as citizens or be forced to live on a reservation. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that all of the Native Americans were blameless in these conflicts. I'm not saying they weren't at times guilty of savage acts, right? The English devils deserved everything they got. There's no doubt in the record that human beings commit atrocities in many ways for many reasons. So I'm not giving a total and complete pass to any and all of the indigenous people. Right, You can't distill these stories down to a simple black and white answer. But, I mean, imagine how you'd feel on your own property. Somebody had arrived, just stepped over your property line into your homeland and said, Hey, guess what? You have now been discovered. And now I stake my claim upon land and resources that have been yours for generations Oh, let's make this a business transaction. Look, here's some spare change in my pocket. So now you have officially been paid as part of a business deal. You have been, quote unquote, compensated. Now pack up your shit and get out. Oh, wait, you still need a place to live? You and your family and your tribe and your community? Okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, You can live over here in a place of my choosing. 
And again, you're welcome. Imagine how you and I would feel if we were considered second class, primitives, savages, candidates for kidnapping and slavery and abuse, or at the very least considered undeserving of equality. What if you and I had been forced to become the landless subordinates to English authority? The only other choice was to go to war, right? They're going to come and demand and take and do what they want. Our choice is to either surrender or go to war against a government that's better funded, better equipped, and almost certain to crush us. I'm not saying that you and I are guilty for the crimes of our ancestors. I came out of religion, right? Christianity. I don't believe in original sin. (laughs) Okay. It's not my fault that somebody in the 16 and 1700s and 1800s, et cetera, did some horrible thing. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm not talking about white guilt. I'm talking about acknowledging the wrongs of our past, because that is important. To acknowledge the wrongs took place, to make an honest account of our history, bloody as it has been, it's still a necessary history for us to know and to understand and to teach. And that story does not begin with Plymouth Rock. Beyond all the bloodshed and the conquest lies this myth that history really didn't even begin until the Europeans showed up, right? I mean, that's when our history books sort of start the story. Well, that's when things began back in the 1600s. But people that lived here for thousands of years, 12,000 years, the Native American tribes are estimated to have already lived here. And starting our history lessons thousands of years after they'd already lived on these lands, it's kind of a way of brushing them off, dismissing them, erasing who they were and where they were and what they did. Native Americans weren't even allowed to become actual, formal citizens of the United States until 1924. 1924. They weren't even allowed to vote in all 50 states for decades after that, well into the mid-20th century. And even then, they'd met resistance, poll taxes. They were given, quote, literacy tests. You got to pass this test to be qualified to vote. There was fraud. There was intimidation. This is our recent history. This is like yesterday, right? This is still in our rearview mirror, and we can see it. If only we'll take the time to look. And so here we are in the United States of America. We're on the holiday of Thanksgiving. For some people, a national day of mourning. Those of us who are the descendants of the colonists, we celebrate with gratitude and thankfulness. Certainly, we should be thankful. I mean, I get it. We should give thanks whenever possible, whether it's a designated holiday or a regular day on the calendar. You know, don't forget to look around, take stock, give thanks for the goodness in your life. Show appreciation for what you have. But it's totally dishonest to ignore many of the reasons that we have it. Again, I'm not talking about original sin. I don't believe the children and the grandchildren should be punished for the sins of the fathers. Nor am I saying that every nation on this planet does not have some sordid and bloody chapter in its past. All right, I'm not trying to blame 21st century human beings for what has come before, but we have a responsibility to know what happened, to acknowledge and understand what happened, to understand why and how so many of our so-called heroes were in fact Nothing of the kind. Yeah, some people operated without malice, and they really did want to start a peaceful new life on these shores. But so many other people arrived on somebody else's doorstep with an eye toward conquest and oppression and wiping out resistance. And the indigenous people who were already here and raising their families on this continent were no doubt considered conquerable by those who decided that they were white and superior and were given dominion by their God over these quote-unquote savages. These people built whole communities, whole cities upon the graves of the tribes they had conquered. So the happy, bright, colorful paintings of the Mayflower might be magical to young children. This is a half-truth, maybe not even a half-truth, a partial truth. 
These pretty colors are there to cover up the darker shades. They also propagate what I think are unhealthy notions about nobility and superiority, ambivalence about the past, even bigotry in people who should be taught to care about other people, about the past, about reality, about the truth, care about your fellow human beings. And when you and I and our societies and our cultures realize that something wrong was done, a terrible deed was done, even something that happened long ago, generations before we were born, are you and I prepared as moral creatures to say, yeah, it happened? Yes, I admit, I understand it happened. I acknowledge it happened. And you know what? We need to do whatever we can to make things right. Not because you and I are guilty of committing the offense, but because a wrong has been done. And we have the opportunity and the ability to help make it right. We do it because it happened and because we care about people. You know, whitewashing history, that's something that the conquerors do. It's something that the oppressors do. Learning from history, that's something that humanists do. And so here on this holiday, as we show our gratitude for so much of what we have, let's also take some time and let's channel some of those energies into the recognition of those who came before, who'd been here 12,000 years before the supposed discovery of this land. People who have been marginalized and discriminated against and shoved into the corner for hundreds of years, they deserve our time, our empathy, our advocacy, and the honest admission that they have been wronged, their people have been wronged, and we need to make an active pursuit out of trying to make things right, whatever that means. With that kind of honesty and transparency, then Thanksgiving can exist without being a cheat. It can be real and legitimate and meaningful and done for the right reasons. And we can temper that gratitude with responsibility. We can see past our own table, past our own tribe, our own inner circle. And we can see out into the circles of other people. And we can share our humanity. And we can work together to solve our problems and right our wrongs and to help our fellow human beings to reject the worst parts of our ancestors and ourselves to give thanks, and to build a better world. Have a safe and wonderful holiday, and thank you so much for listening. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website thethinkingatheist.com